Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about galvanic corrosion without a time limit. Now, corrosion is a chemical process that affects all sorts of devices and objects, electronic circuits being no different. But what makes galvanic corrosion special is that it's a far more accelerated process. So when conditions are met to allow this phenomenon to occur, you will end up getting problems far sooner than by normal corrosion. Therefore, it's something to keep in mind when creating complex designs with multiple conductive materials in contact. So if you care about this and much more, then keep watching. So to understand galvanic corrosion, the first thing to talk about of course is chemical batteries in general. Now without going into too many details, the most basic form of battery can be built by placing two different metals into an electrolyte solution. Based on the reduction potential of the two metals, the one with the most negative reduction potential will end up oxidizing and dissolving into the solution. So it will go from a metal into a metal ion and letting off some electrons. Now to get this reaction to actually take place, you also need a counter reaction at the other electrode where something from the solution ends up reducing. So accepting electrons. Now the electrons don't go from one electrode to the other through the solution, but rather through an external circuit. So we get a current. And now based on the particular reactions that are taking place, we will get a specific voltage out of this cell. Now it's important to mention that you don't just care about what metals you're using, you also care about the solution. So what it contains, what's its pH, what is the temperature at which you're running the reaction. So all of these factors will have an effect on what sort of voltage and what sort of currents you can get out of this sort of battery. But long story short, a battery is born. Now one easy way of trying this phenomenon out is using a lemon, so for the acid inside it, and I sticked two pieces of metal, so an aluminum piece and a copper piece, into the lemon. And if we now measure the voltage that's generated, we get about 600 and something millivolts. Another basic battery that you can try can be built around the potato, so this is where the electrolytes are, and what I place here is a piece of copper wire and a screw that has been galvanized. So there's a coating of zinc on it. And if I connect this to my voltmeter, we can see roughly 890, 900 millivolts. So you can build a battery with an acidic electrolyte. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the key element here is not the presence of the acid, but rather that it's an electrolyte. So it has free ions in the solution. And any water-based solution will have ions to a certain extent. It doesn't necessarily have to be an acid. So what I have here is a bit of copper and aluminum tape glued to this container and connected to the multimeter. And here I have a bit of tap water. So if I just pour this water into the container, we can see a voltage developing. Now tap water isn't perfectly clean, it has quite a lot of things in it, but even if you would use something like distilled water, it would not stay distilled for long. So various things from the atmosphere will dissolve into it, starting with carbon dioxide and dust and other impurities, and well, if there's any sort of impurities on the surface of the two electrodes, those will also dissolve. So even if you start off with perfectly pure water, it will not stay like that for long. Point is, you can build a battery quite easily. You just need water that isn't pure, it won't be a great battery but to some extent it will work, and water in small quantities can be obtained from the air. You can easily get condensation or just absorption into things like dust when it's very humid. Now coming back to the electrodes, to get the battery to work, you need electrodes made from different materials. And the more different they are, the higher voltage the battery will give. Now to compare materials, you have literature sources in which metals are ordered by their anodic index. So an easy to find example in this sense is the galvanic corrosion Wikipedia page. So right at the end, we see a nice list of metals ordered according to their anodic index. 
but this should not be taken as a singular resource, since most practical materials aren't made from pure metals, but rather some sort of alloys. So you can get differences from what is found in the table and what you measure in reality, since in a sense you're looking at two different things. So why is this phenomenon a problem, specifically in electronics? Well, the battery that you will end up seeing is not the nice experimental setup that we've seen until now, but rather it's most often a contact point between two different PCBs or structures. So if you have a PCB with some copper trace on it, that is either bare copper or tin plated, and you have a spring in contact with it, say it's plated with gold, and you add a bit of moisture to the mix, well, you end up creating a battery. Now, you will never really see the voltage that this battery develops in the circuit, but you will see the effects of the current going through the battery. So because the two terminals of the battery are short-circuited, so directly through the contact point, the battery is in effect short-circuited, and so we get a current flow. Now, again, this current is very small, so that's not really the problem, but over time, what you will see is the effect of the battery in action, so the anode side corroding into the solution. So this exact case can be commonly found in hard drives. The body of the disk drive has gold-plated contacts, but the PCB is either OSP, organic surface preservative, so copper, or it's tin-plated. And after a few years, when the warranty has expired, of course, you get disappearing. Now, I'm not saying this is why this particular disk drive broke, but I'm pretty sure that it was a contributing factor. If you create electrical contacts from different materials, over time you can end up having interrupted contacts from this mechanism. The main measure you can take to prevent this issue is keeping the two contact materials the same. Specifically talking about PCBs and connectors, a common good practice is the use of gold fingers. You can of course plate the whole PCB with gold, but that's expensive. So to make things cheaper, you can only plate the sides of the PCB. So with things like RAM memory sticks, you get both the contact area on the PCB and the connector plated with the same material, so no galvanic corrosion issues can occur. Another important case to analyze is when the electrical contact is not mandatory for basic functionality. For example, if you have an electromagnetic shield over your circuit, with or without the shield, most often the circuit will work just fine. But without the shield, you are usually not compliant with the necessary emissions or immunity standards. So what I have here is a cooling structure from a laptop placed in contact with the PCB. And we can see that over time, the contact area ended up oxidizing from galvanic corrosion. Now, there is still some electrical contact even with this, there's also some other points of contact, but if the structure would have any sort of shielding properties, this sort of imperfect contact can render the shield less useful than, well, not having it at all. Working with the exact same materials is not always an option, so there's another common measure that can be taken, and that is to keep in contact only slightly dissimilar materials. So I found a similar structure in a different laptop, and interestingly enough, there was this plastic washer thing that prevented direct contact between the PCB and the magnesium cooling structure, but electrical contact was nevertheless maintained through a set of galvanized metal pieces. Now, I don't know exactly what all those metals were in contact, but by using this sort of approach in which you use multiple metals in contact, you can prevent having a very large voltage generated between the two extreme metals by splitting it up into multiple smaller voltages that are less likely to cause problems. So the closer two different materials are on the anodic index list, the least likely they are to cause problems by galvanic corrosion. So if the voltage difference between them is below 3-400 millivolts, usually it's safe. So one way of protecting two extreme metals in contact is to get them in contact with some extra materials that provide much smaller voltage potential differences. So the lower the voltage that the battery can provide, the smaller the problems it will end up causing. Now, to highlight this topic, I found a very nice document. So this is about corrosion resistance of aluminum enclosures, so written by Mr. J. Jumeau. And right at the end, we get this very nice anodic index graph in which we have a set of metals and alloys 
ordered by their anodic index, but we also get the voltages that develop in between the metals. And well, the graph doesn't just order the metals, but intercompares them. So we have a nice table in which the voltages are ordered against a color code, so with small voltages below 300 millivolts. You assume that we have a safe situation, and with voltages above 800 millivolts, you assume you have a very bad situation. So if we have two structures in contact, so one of them is made from mild steel and the other one is made from gold, so gold plated, then the voltage that will develop in between the two is 870 millivolts, so it's a dangerous combination. But if we were to include, say, a copper washer in between the two, then the voltage difference between copper and the steel is 430, so we're already in the light yellow, which is almost safe. And then in between copper and gold, again, we have 440. So by creating a free metal structure, we can interconnect the two extreme metals with an intermediate metal while still keeping the structure safe. In the end, there are multiple things that can be done about galvanic corrosion. Using the same metals on both contacts, or at least metals that develop very small voltage potentials, or better yet, preventing any possible humidity from accessing the contact point. Regardless, the first thing to do is to keep this phenomenon in mind when creating structures with different metals in contact. Always check how far apart the two metals are on a galvanic series chart. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.